Hey everyone, Jim Branscombe from Cinematic Void here, about to take another journey into the mouth of Cinemadness, where we kind of go through the primordial ooze of films that I watched growing up that had a huge impact on me and basically formed the basis of what eventually would become Cinematic Void. The film we're going to talk about today was a film I saw around 13 or 14 as I was getting the horror movies and just basically buying anything that I could get my hands on. And when I watched it, I absolutely loved this movie, only to find out that it was considered one of the most hated films in the franchise it belonged to. And the reason why I was hated was probably one of the most stupidest reasons to hate the film. I mean, considering what, when that factor was added into the sequels that came after that, wasn't like it got better because that thing was in there. But it's actually wonderful now that this film has gone from hated sequel to one of the most beloved cult classics of the franchise and actually maybe the horror genre in general now. I am talking about Halloween 3 Season the Witch directed by Tommy Lee Wallace. Halloween 3 season of the witch the night no one comes home sort of like the evil dead trilogy where i saw it from army of darkness going back to evil dead i saw the halloween franchise movies in all kinds of out of order actually that was kind of pretty much the norm for any horror franchise i didn't see everything from first movie to the last movie it was just whatever was available that i could see be it on tv or to rent that's just how i watched it i remember watching phantasm 3 off of hbo without having seen phantasm 1 and 2. so with that said i ended up seeing halloween 3 before i saw halloween part 1. actually i saw halloween 2 and 3 before part 1 because i bought both of them on vhs in the same day i think i got them at kmart just like i got night living dead for saving place make saving nice with quality at a kmart price it was probably around Halloween season, so they had a whole big bin of like basically cheapo horror movies that you get for like a couple bucks, and Halloween 2 and 3 were in that box. Both the films were released on a VHS company called Good Times that used to license things from Universal Studios, mostly their horror films, and they were like $2.99, maybe $3.99 at the most each, so I picked them both up. I ended up watching Halloween 2 first because I figured I need to see that in order to get the Halloween 3 and I watched that with my grandfather and let me tell you when the nurse gets in the hot tub it's kind of an awkward thing to be a young teenager watching with your 67 year old grandfather <laughs> maybe a day or so later I ended up watching Halloween 3 on my own and one it was very clear that Michael Myers wasn't the focus of it and to me that was okay because I love the silver shamrock masks. I love the performance of Tom Atkins in it. It was just this perfect mix of occultism, folklore, and technology all melded together. And I just really got behind it. And plus, it took place on Halloween, which was really, really cool. I remember loving the score to it that John Carpenter and Alan Howarth did. And it was just like, wow, this is great. Only to find out that people absolutely hated this sequel because it had no Michael Myers. Michael! I had an older cousin that actually had the opportunity to see Halloween 3 upon its original theatrical release and his only comment about it was like, yeah, it just sucked, it had no Michael Myers. Really, the guy in the William Shatner mask was the deciding factor on what made this movie good or bad. I mean, that was the only reason people would give over and over again. And it didn't really make much sense because how is it any worse than any of the sequels that came after it. It's not like any of those were well thought out. Just because it had Michael Myers in it, it's somehow better? No, most of those sequels are not very good. But why the hell are you dressed like me anyway? I ain't paying you to be Michael Myers. I'm playing Michael Myers. As I was meeting more people who were into cult films, I used Halloween 3 as a bit of a litmus test. And what I mean by that is that we would talk about movies and you know, it's like, oh, I like the first Elm Street, like this and that. And I would just casually mention Halloween 3. And depending on their reaction, I would either keep talking to them and be their friend, or that would be the end of the conversation. So when I met someone who's just as excited about Halloween 3 as I was, hey, we we're gonna be friends. But if you gave the stock generic answer of like, well, it's not very good because there's no Michael Myers, Nope, not gonna be part of my friend circle. I think this whole thing is a big joke. And that's just how I rolled for many, many years. It was a great way to like find like-minded people. It's sort of like when you're in the punk rock and 
when you hear someone talk about a band you really like but no one knows what it's about, you can make a connection that way. Halloween 3 was a film that I can make connections with through other cult film fans. There's a lot of things I really liked about Halloween 3, but the thing I might have liked the most about it was that score by Alan Howarth and John Carpenter. It was kind of more interesting and had different layers than the, some of the stuff they had done previously. And I was really obsessed with it. And because I was into punk rock and I was collecting records, I really wanted to find Halloween 3 on vinyl. I searched high and low. Anytime I went to a record store, went right to the soundtrack section, tried to find it, never found it. My friend Jim DeHaven, who I met back in eighth grade because of our mutual love of Evil Dead 2, was also big in Halloween 3. And we always would get competitive over who's gonna find Halloween 3 soundtrack on vinyl first. And that fucker ended up finding it before I did. And I think he paid less than 10 bucks for it. And I was mad and I was jealous, but he was at least kind enough to actually rip the vinyl and put it on CD so I would have the song so I could have the full soundtrack to listen to. It took a bunch of years, but eventually I did manage to get my own original copy of Halloween 3. So this is one of my prized possessions, but I also have another copy, which was one of the early releases from Death Waltz Recording Company. This was I think the first time it had been reissued, I know there's a couple more reissues, but this is the only one I have, and so yeah, I own this soundtrack twice. That is how much I love that score and love this movie. I also have the novelization, because hey, I'm a big nerd, I really like this movie. Actually, I'll go one further, I have a Halloween 3 tattoo. And not to mention, over my head right here, I also have all three Silver Shamrock Halloween masks. So it's been great watching Halloween 3 grow and become really the cult classic it deserved and always should have been. One of the coolest things I got to do because of Halloween 3 and working at the American Cinematheque and doing Cinematic Void and doing stuff with Beyond Fest was I got to moderate a Q&A with Halloween 3 star Tom Atkins. Now, years ago, maybe like 2006, I went to a horror convention in Hunt Valley, Maryland. I forget what the convention's called, but Tom Atkins was a guest there. And I remember he was sitting at a table by himself. He was drinking Miller Lite. He had a stack of the Fog DVD that MGM had just put out. So I went up to him, I bought a shirt. It was the shirt that had Atkins on it and his like cartoon face. And I talked to him a little bit. And before I left the table, I remember saying, just so you know, I really love you in Halloween 3. And he just stared at me, trying to figure out if I was just maybe fucking with him or just, was being sincere or not. But years later, at Beyond Fest, we put together a tom where we showed three movies starring Tom Atkins. It was The Fog, Night of the Creeps, and of course, Halloween 3. I was dressed in a white tuxedo because I was playing Dom Atkins during the intermission and intro segments of the marathon before Tom showed up. And I was told that I had to keep the white tuxedo on. I didn't have the mustache. So when I met Tom Atkins, I think he thought I was like the head of the theater because I was wearing a ill-fitted tuxedo, but doing a Q&A with Tom Atkins. He had such great stories, such great one-liners, and I even got to let him have his justice over Halloween 3. So there were a lot of people who were disappointed that Michael Myers wasn't in it, and I don't care. <laughs> A lot of the movies thus far I've talked about in the mouth of Cinematis are movies that I really love but haven't really revisited. But I will say Halloween 3 I definitely revisit at least once a year. I showed it back in 2021 as a Halloween hangover in Cinematic Void and I also included in the Seven Years of Void Marathon. It's just a fun movie and it's great to watch it with the audience. It's great to watch it with the audience that gets it and embraces it and doesn't give a shit that Michael Myers isn't in it. So that wraps up this edition of In the Mouth of Cinemadness. Let me know what you've been thinking about this series. I've had a lot of fun kind of go through my memory and you know how I discovered these movies and how they had an impact on me and led to, you know, cinematic void happening. Until next time, see you in the void. And happy Halloween. <laughs>